All right, guys, thanks so much for coming. Uh, we're going to get started because we're a little bit behind schedule. But uh, it's, uh, it, it's really nice to be here with you guys. I appreciate everyone coming. My name's Br uh, Ben. I almost. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Why? <laughs> Don't laugh about that. My name is Ben. And uh, my wife's name's Brooke. And this is Jean as well. She came on the mission team with us. And uh, we are the leaders of the Newcastle Church. And uh, if you don't know, I grew up in Sydney my whole life, and it's been fun, it's awesome, and we had the privilege and the honor to plant the Newcastle Church early this year. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, and uh, it's just, it's been a wild ride, but it's been an encouraging ride, and it's been so awesome. So I've got four points. We're going to cherry pick scriptures, and we're going to be talking about what, what's it take to be on the mission team? What's the heart of someone who wants to be on the team? And what kind of, t uh, what kind of heart do I need to be on the mission field? Because I do believe it's quite hard. I come from the big church in Sydney, a church of 400 people. We're leading a big region and uh, we go on the mission field. It gets a lot smaller real quick. So you get out there, you get out on the team and... Uh, you know, there's very distinct moments that we remember. But I do want to preface this. My lesson is going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. And as a great man once said, Dumbledore, it is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> this is the Goblet of Fire. And he tells all the students, if you're going to put your name on a piece of paper and throw it in the goblet, you've got to understand that it's going to be challenging. Being on the mission field is challenging. Putting your hand up and saying, here I am, send me, it is difficult. Yeah. And it's maybe more difficult than I was anticipating and maybe more difficult than some of you guys might be anticipating. Yeah. And this lesson is going to show us uh, what that looks like. If you're going to put your name on the list of whatever the next planting is going to be, we're going we're gonna to talk about the reality of things and we're going to talk about things that have been helpful for us. But there's three distinct moments that I really remember. And the first one was the hype and getting on the stage. Yes. So this is the mission team. We were sent out with 15 people and Rusty wasn't on the team just yet. He actually came from the Gold Coast Church. And I remember it got announced, hey, we're going we're gonna to plant the church. Who wants to do it? Brooke and I just said, yep, we're keen. Let's do it. Wherever it is. And the options were either Canberra or Newcastle. And the church just decided, let's do Newcastle. And we said, wherever, we're going wherever. But I remember this moment, and it was great. And everyone pats you on the back and says, yeah, that's awesome. Good on you guys. And you buy into the hype a little bit. But I also remember the first service as well. And we had about 50 people at the service, and it looks packed. And it was very encouraging. You get there. We moved in the day before. We had this massive service because everyone wants to be at the first service, right? Yeah. So a lot of people came up from Sydney, and it was cool. I used to preach to a church of 100, a uh, region of 100, and then I was, church and, I was preaching to a church of 50, and it felt pretty good. But the distinct moment when things set in was the next service. <laughs> because if you look at all these chairs, we had about 12 people there. We had two lines, and we had one visitor. And I came to church and I thought, oh my goodness, what have we done? <laughs> we were the only people that had, uh, who actually moved up that time. And we had Freeman living at our house. He actually stayed with us for about three months, which was awesome and challenging at the same time. <laughs> but I remember that first service and that, that's really when reality hits in. There's no more slapping you on the back and saying, good on you, man, go for it. That's actually where you got to go here to reach out to people, yeah. and I, uh, you know, there's no more support anymore. <laughs> but the, the, the question comes, why, why did we plant the church? Why did we want to throw our hand up no matter where we went? I, I don't know the answer to that per se. I kind of read my Bible. I got convicted all the time. I got inspired by so many men who left their people or left their home to go preach the word. 
and God has worked in incredible ways. But this passage really resonated with me in Romans chapter 10. In verse 14, it says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in, and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they have been sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And I looked at my people, I looked at Australians, and I, I thought, man, we have some churches, which is great, and people get to hear the good news, but we don't have enough. Yeah. We haven't hit all the places we need to hit. We actually have to carry the good news. And the Bible says if you're willing to do that on the team, you have beautiful feet. <laughs> the feet are the smelly part of the body where you have socks on, they get dirty, and the Bible just says even the worst part of you is beautiful if you're willing to go carry the good news to someone. Yeah. Wow. And I believe God works. Yeah. When people are willing to be sent, when people put their hand up and say, hey, here I am, send me. And this message was actually all throughout the Bible as I read it. From the very first book of the Bible, God has this dream for people to go, for people to go when they're comfortable to go reach out to people. You know, I think of great men from the Bible, starting from Abram. Before he got the name Abraham, he was sent. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, from your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. He was sent right from the start. This great man goes on to be a great nation. He gets blessed by God, and God reassures him, hey, I'm, I'm with you. But he actually had to sacrifice his people. Yep. He had to sacrifice his family to go out on the planting and Lot jumps in with him. The next guy who gets sent is in Exodus 3 verse 10. It's, it's Moses. And he's not sent away from his family. He's actually sent back to his people. Yep. He's not sent to a foreign mission field. He's sent back. And this is when God talks to him in the burning bush. And he's comfortable being a shepherd. He likes what he's doing. And the Lord says to him, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. If you keep going in the Bible, there's more and more calls for people to be sent, to go. Isaiah then, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And then the Lord simply replies, You've got to go. Go tell these people. Go tell these people. And Jeremiah 1 verse 8, Then the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm too young. You're going to have doubts if you go out on the mission field. You're going to feel like, Man, there's a lot of reasons why I shouldn't go. And God says, You can't say them. You must go to everyone I send to you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. There's a lot of fear going out on the mission team. And a lot of us actually feel that when you're out there. But God has a heart for his people all the time. And I thought about when I got reached out to and I thought about, you know, if, if people didn't go, if, if great men didn't come here, I would never become a disciple and we got to have the heart to carry the good news with those beautiful feet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it started right from the beginning that people were sent. And this is not a lesson for a leader who's going to be sent. This is a lesson for the team who's going to go with them. Mm -hmm. And what's it going to take? What kind of heart do I have to have to be sent? Well, the first point is this. We've got to have a healthy dream. Open up your Bibles to Psalms 126. You've got to have a healthy dream. You know, when we first come into the kingdom, we're full of dreams, right? My dream was to convert my family. And, I, you know, God's work. Some of my brothers became Christians, and that's awesome. And when all of us come into the kingdom, we had dreams. We had dreams for God, for our people, and to see the church built up. But somewhere along the line, sometimes we lose our dreams yeah. and we stop yeah. dreaming dreams and we get stagnant. And in the Bible, in, in Psalms 126, it says, When the Lord restored the fortunes to, of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. 
Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations that the Lord has done great things for them. And the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out, are, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaths with them. Wow. You know, if you've got an NIV Bible next to the word dreamed, you should have a little one which is a footnote if you go to the bottom of your Bible and you have really good eyesight. And the foot show, footnote should actually say, or restored to health. So the Bible says it's, it's the same word, or it's a different version of the word, where it says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. But you could easily translate it, we were like those who were restored to health. What's the point right there? Well, if you're not dreaming, you're not healthy spiritually. Wow. And so many of us stop dreaming, and I dare say we've lost our spiritual health. Yeah. It's a healthy thing to be a dreamer. Yeah. We got to dream big for the kingdom of God. We got to dream for our country, for our people, for Australia, for all the islands out there. We got to have these great dreams. Yeah. And you know what makes this passage even more convicting or intense is actually the, the historical background or the context of the passage. You know, we sing the song, Men Who Dream, and it starts off with, Captives came back into Zion. <laughs> uh, from their freedom came a scheme while the city lays in ruin. We believe they had a dream. So the context is the Israelites are not in Zion. They're in captivity. But they had this dream, I'm going to get back to the promised land one day. Yeah. I'm going to get back there and it's going to be awesome. I have, this, I have this dream just to see what Zion's all about. Yeah. But what happens when they get there mm. is the city's actually in ruin. Yeah. The fields are overgrown. The city's completely destroyed. But they dream to get to that place. Mm. And you know what happens and makes this passage even more intense if you read verse 5 of the passage, it says, Those who sow with tears will weep, reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaths with them. So we sing this song in a very happy light, like, man, we're going we're gonna to reap a great harvest. It's so great. I have so much joy. But we miss those two lines where it says they actually had to sow tears sow seeds with tears. They dream to get back to, the, to Zion, but when you get there, there's a reality where this, this city's in ruins. Yeah. And if you're coming out of captivity, you have a, a scarce amount of seed and food. And they would, have had, they would have had a decision to make where they get back there and they've got a small amount of seed that they could eat, or the other option is they could go hungry for a bit, take that seed and plant it in the ground. And they're, they're, they're sowing their seed with tears in their eyes. Like, God, please make this happen. And that's a pretty hard decision to make for all of us. <laughs> we can dream of getting to Zion, but when we actually have to take our food and scatter it in the ground, that's when reality hits in. And you've got to have some deep faith to do that. Yeah. And it's a hard choice to make. But the promise is right here that they, they reap with songs of joy. They return with songs of joy, carrying sheaths with them. So they actually, they have this abundant harvest. Yeah. And it's an incredible way in which God works. And sometimes for us, God calls us to put our seed in the ground. You got to put everything in there. You got to go hungry for a little bit so that I can work. Trust me when I do that. And God does bless us. Yeah. We're going to hear from an incredible dreamer right now. Jean's got some thoughts. She's got a lot of dreams. Let's welcome her up. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, like I've always had the dream of being a part of a church planting and to be on this great adventure of God. I was ready to go. I didn't have anything holding me back in Sydney and I could easily keep the job I have and work remotely. 
Um, but at that point, I didn't really know Ben and Brooke, and honestly, I thought they were really scary. <laughs> um, and that I wouldn't get along well with them. Um, yeah, and that made me really hesitant and fearful to join the team, and I prayed that God would really change my heart if that was His plan for me. And he did. I remember joining in on the last mission team meeting and when Ben was sharing about the church planting expectations, I got so excited that I knew that the dream I had for God was so much greater and more exciting that the fear didn't matter to me anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I moved up to Newcastle without a place to stay and I moved in with James and Shuna for a couple months before we actually found a place. And it also got pretty lonely at times, not having people my age, um, my friends around me, mm. and I was also struggling a little financially from the move. Um, yeah, and a couple months after the move, I suddenly got made redundant, and that really shook me because not only am I without a job, but it also meant that I would lose my visa to stay in the country mm. because I was being sponsored by my company. And it was really hard having to scramble and figure out what my options were because I really wanted to stay in Newcastle and further this dream. Um, there were many tears and doubts about whether God really wanted me to be here and what His plan was for me. And a verse that I really held on to is Romans 8, 28, where it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Yeah. And it really helped me trust that whatever happens, God works for the good, um, though it might not feel that way in the moment. So yeah, I applied for heaps of jobs in Newcastle and in Sydney, trying out every avenue that I could to hopefully land a job that will sponsor me on a visa. And it was a really rough time getting rejections and interviews, but not really making it far because of my visa situation and the uncertainty of everything. Many interviews later, I got offered a job that was pretty much perfect in every way. The people and the manager were really nice. It was a job I'd be great at, that pays pretty well, and most importantly, they would sponsor me on a visa. Wow. Sounds great, hey? <laughs> um, but yeah, <clears throat> the only catch was that it's a job in Sydney that I have to travel back and forth to and that's a four hour travel time every day. And it was so hard because I needed a visa to stay but I knew that if I were to accept this job it meant that I wouldn't be able to be as present in this church planting and I might have to move back to Sydney just to stay in the country. Um, I knew there was the other option of going back to school and getting a part-time job to support myself financially, which I didn't hate, but ideally I would have loved to have a full-time job instead. And it wasn't easy, but I fought to be faithful and turn down that job because I didn't want to give up this dream of doing great things for God in Newcastle. Yeah, so I ended up back in school and basically got offered a job at the best cafe in Newcastle, where Clara <laughs> works. Um, yeah, and now instead of working part-time at a cafe, I got offered the opportunity to work as an intern in the Newcastle church. Awesome. And yeah, <laughs> through this whole journey, God has given me a new dream, a dream to plant the church with a team in the future. Yeah. And as it says in Psalm 126, those who go out, we go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, um, carrying sheaves with them. And instead of choosing to eat my last seeds in fear, I sowed them in tears and in fear, not knowing where it would lead me. But I know that as long as I did it in faith, God is a faithful God and there will be a harvest and there will be joy. Awesome. <laughs> right. so the question comes for all of us is, man, I got this dream, but do I have the heart to put the seed in the ground? Yeah. What, what, what faith is God calling me to? Because it's not... It's not just reaping a harvest. You actually got to do something about it. Amen. So hopefully that's a little bit of a reality check. And we're going to keep moving on. We're going to go to teamwork makes the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. So what's made uh, Newcastle an awesome church? It's, it's not me or Brooke by any means. It's actually the team that we're with. Yeah. We love the team. The team is an incredible team. And we're going to talk about Paul's mentality when he planted the church as well. So let's go to Acts chapter 12. And look at this, guys. Be prepared. We're going through Acts. We're going through Acts. So uh, we are studying this out as a church. And it's kind of inspiring because you're doing the thing that Paul's doing when you read this passage. And you're going to have to flick through your Bible. If you have a physical one, it's going to be helpful. But if we start... In uh, Acts 12, verse 25, you know, Paul uh, definitely has a great team when he plants churches. A phrase you're going to hear all the time is Paul and his companions. Paul and his companions. Paul and his companions. He never does it solo. It's an incredible team. 
If you're gonna go into planting, you gotta buy into the culture and you gotta say, man, I'm a, I'm a team player. I'm gonna do what the team needs. In verse 25 of chapter 12, it says, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. He writes the book of Mark. Now in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mania, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Why would they were worshiping the Lord and fasting? The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work in which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. That's kind of the, the moment where they go on the stage and, and the elders pray. They put their hands on them, give them a spiritual blessing. Guys, it's time to go. There's hype right there. And who buys into the hype? John Mark. He's part of the team. He's part of the team that's going to do great things. And if a lot of you guys know, if you jump down to verse 13, they go from Pamphios, Paul and his companions sailed to Pergia and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. So what happens to John? He buys into the hype. He's in the team. But something along the way happens where he says, man, this is too hard. I can't keep up with this. I don't want to do it anymore, and he returns to Jerusalem. Yeah. If you want to see a map of all Paul's plantings, uh, a lot of us think that Jerusalem plants churches. Oh, that's not the right map. It's actually Antioch. The church in Antioch is the church that planted uh, all the, the churches, and that's the church that Paul comes from with Barnabas. Mm -hmm. So Pamphylia, uh, Pamphos and Silas is here, Sal Salamis, sorry, and that's where John bails. So he gets there, he buys into the hype, and he doesn't make it very far. And you'll see that Paul will actually travel through all over here. If you read the book of Acts, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see where he went. And these are all his four missionary journeys when he planted churches all throughout the world. He ends up in Rome, and then he eventually dies on his fourth missionary journey. But Paul was a planter, and he had a lot of companions with him. He had a great team, but not everyone was a great team player. Yeah. Let's go to Acts 15. Let's go. I'm going to go back so you can keep up with it. Acts 15, verse 36. It says, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in all the town where we had preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he deserted them from Pamphylia and had not continued with the work with them. They have a sharp dis disagreement. Barnabas goes his own way. Paul keeps going. And Paul's not going as a lone wolf, because if you actually jump down to verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where, he, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, and Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew his father was a Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. If you jump down to verse 6 of chapter 16, it says, Paul and his companions. So Paul and his companions comes up again, traveled through the region of uh, Pamphylia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Asia. Jump down to chapter 17, verse 1. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphilius and Alponia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And then what happens is he gets run out of town, and Timothy and Silas actually stay in that town. If you jump down to verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens. So he's actually having to wait for them. He had to keep going. Jump down to Acts 18, verse 5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the news that Jesus was the Messiah. So why am I cherry picking all these scriptures? It's so you actually see what happens in Paul's life. And you see what kind of man Timothy is. So there's a contrast between being a team player of Mark John 
And there's a contrast between Timothy and what kind of man he was and how he was a team player. Mark gives up when things get tough. Timothy is pretty tough dude just to get on the planting. So Timothy is someone who literally gets some skin in the game before he's even on the team. Paul has to circumcise him. If you're a man, that's a bit of a tough ask just to get on the team. Hey, you want to sign up? This is what you got to do. And Paul has that moment with him and you think, oh my goodness. And if you read Acts 15, we're not going to read it, but they actually decide that no one needs to get circumcised to be a Christian. And then Paul preaches that message. Timothy says, man, I'm so inspired. I want to go on the team. And then Paul says, sweet, we're going to circumcise you. (laughs) What do we learn from that? (laughs) Timothy's a team player. For the sake of critics, Timothy's going to do whatever it takes to get on the team and be a team player. Paul has to do things. He gets chased out of uh, town. He, He goes to Athens. And what does he do with Timothy? He leaves him behind. And he actually says, hey, Timothy, you're in charge for a moment. i got to keep going because I'm going to get killed if I stay here. And Timothy's like, no worries. Whatever you say, I'm going to do it. I'm a team player. I'm all a part of it. Whatever the, whatever the need of the church is, I'm in. And you've got to be a yes man or a yes woman to be on a planting. You want to be part of the planting, you've got to buy into the culture no matter what the culture is. And that's something that we've really... Uh, worked on with the team is say, hey, we're all in this together. Wherever people go, we're we're in it together. Whatever we got to do, we're in it together. We are a team. It is not Ben and Brooke at the front. We are a team. We are a team and we have a culture. You got to buy in. And I think Mark doesn't quite buy in. That's why he backdoors it and he bails. And for a lot of us, we actually had to buy into the team before we even got on the planting. There were sacrifices that had to be made, and God continues to call us to sacrifice all the time. We, uh, we had three boys living with us for a long time, and that was fun, but it was a sacrifice. And it wasn't as we planned it to be. You want to get on the team, you've got to be a player. You've got to be a team player. And I'm going to get Brooke to share about that now. Um... Yeah, I am naturally a mark, so I've had to learn this lesson. Um, But like Ben said, I actually really needed to learn this lesson before I went on the planting to a large extent. Um, You know, the idea of a church or a ministry culture, it is something we can talk about a lot in general and something that Ben and I certainly talked a lot about when it came to planting a new church. Um, And I, I found it to be somewhat of an elusive idea, like how do you create a culture or how do you change a culture? Um, You know, we knew for sure the church in Newcastle would need a culture like what Paul had with his companions. Um, And and like Ben said, I definitely know that this church planting hasn't had a great first six months because Ben and I are so amazing. Um, You know, it's it's because of the team that came with us. They came, um, they, they didn't come in with a spectator attitude. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't all about great theoretical dreams. For, for the planting, but there was a consistent following through in those dreams by being quick to get on board with, with every plan or idea or crazy goal that Ben and I came up with. Um, you know, and just like Timothy, just like for Timothy, you know, this, this teamwork wasn't created spontaneously when you get there. It's something each member of the group must cultivate before coming. And I can see this in my life, in my relationship with, with Ben. First as co-leaders, then as a dating couple, then as a married couple. Ben's always been the Paul. He comes up with the crazy radical ideas. And I I know the times that him and I have worked the most effectively for God is when I've been quick to buy into that idea. And what I mean by buy in is not to just have a positive response in the moment or to say, oh, that's a great idea. You should go and do that. Um, Or to come up with reasons why it's such a nice idea for Ben, but sorry, I'm not going to be able to join you because X, Y, and Z. You know, no, God has used Ben in my life to teach me to get on board, to follow wholeheartedly and quickly, even if I'm afraid. For there to be a culture of teamwork on a planting, you'll need to start thinking now about how you're doing in this area, in your marriage, with the brother that you lead with, or in your Bible talk. Are you someone who's quick to say yes, to buy in, to support the leader wholeheartedly? 
Um, or do you have a list of reasons why each idea is too radical or you're too busy or your life won't allow for you to get on board for different reasons? In the lead up to going, I knew that I needed to work on this because I realized if I was a mark before going, I wasn't magically going to turn into a Timothy once I got there. Um, but my life has been such an adventure. Every time I allow God to take the reins and I have the faith to do radical things and follow through on these dreams that the Spirit gives me. Awesome. <clears throat> you want to know what it specifically looks like? You're going to get asked to do a lot of welcomes, a lot of communions. You're going to serve on Kids Kingdom at least twice a year for for. For months, two months, sorry. So that, that, that's a long time. You're going to be asked to preach. There's going to be times like Paul where I can't be in Bible studies and I'm going to say, you lead it. And there's going to be times where Brooke says, I can't be there. You do the thing. There's a lot of things where you got to get ready and you got to say, I'm a team player. I'm all in. Let me learn what I have to learn to do what I have to do. And let me tell you this, the greatest part of the team is not where I have some crazy idea, but it's actually when the people on the team have these crazy ideas. Yeah. You'll notice before they got sent out, they had to fast before they got sent out. And there's a young guy on our team that said, hey, let's fast, you know, I'm going to do a four day straight fast. <laughs> and you know what happens? Everyone buys in. All the boys go, yep, let's do it. I'm on board. Let's fast together for four days straight. Two of them made it, not everyone else made it. <laughs> it's pretty hard to do, but I appreciate the effort, the dream that I'm going to do these great things for God. And you got to ask yourself, am I willing to buy in when things get tough? That's good. Third point so is you got to compete with horses. Let's go. Let's go to Jeremiah 12. Let's go to Jeremiah 12. He is a dude that's sent. you got a, you got a contrast between... Uh, Paul, who's quite good, when he gets sent, he, gets, he converts a lot of people. And then Jeremiah is arguably the, the not so good guy at actually doing and converting people. At the end of his life, there's, there's a lot of chapters where bad things happen. But in verse 1 of Jeremiah, chapter 12, you'll notice if you've got an NIV, it, it has a little, uh, little heading there. And it's Jeremiah's complaint. He complains a lot, but we complain a lot. And the things he complains about are not the things that are uncommon to the things that we complain about. He says this to God, and you know he's in sin just by what he's saying. He says, you are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you, but, but, or it might say yet, yet I would speak with you about your justice. He's questioning God on his justice. And so many times we question God on his justice. Hey, God, this isn't fair. It was so much easier for that person. It was so hard for me. i got some questions for you, God. And he goes on to say, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do the faithless live in ease? You have planted them. You have taken root. They have grown and bear fruit. You, will always, you are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, Lord. You see me and you test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. That's not the heart you need to have on the team. You can't complain to God about justice. Things will be unjust. And God has a really good response to him. In verse 5, God answers and he says, If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in a safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? And God says, hey, I, I want you to race with horses. And he just says, you, you're getting, he says, you, you're getting worn out racing with men on foot. And you're talking about, you know, doing, doing, doing race. He, he's talking about justice and God has a higher expectation for Jeremiah than he does for other people. And he actually has this expectation that you're going to compete with horses. Horses will outrun any man. That is a fact. They are built for speed. They are built to run. And God has this expectation that Jeremiah, if you have some faith, you'll actually be able to run with the horses. 
And as far as being on the mission team, if you can't compete with man, you won't compete with horses. And the point right there is if, if you can't do the basic things well, you will not last on the team. Yeah. You will give in to the mark mentality, but God thinks that Jeremiah can compete with these horses. Mm. And imagine if a man was in the background just running with them, keeping up and doing great things uh, for God. You know, as far as running with men, or even in the second part of the scripture, it says, if you've stumbled in the safe places, how can you, ru- how can you uh, go in the thickets of the Jordan? Mm. The thickets are actually swampy areas on the side of the Jordan, and that's where a lot of wolves and lions will hang out, and that's where they hunt. Mm. And God's saying, hey, if you're walking on a flat ground and you're tripping over and you're fighting that hard, if you can't just walk right now, how are you going to get through this stuff? And as far as being on the planting, there's an expectation that I'm, I'm trying to compete with horses here. I'm not comparing myself with other people. I'm, I'm not trying to just do the basics. I'm trying to do something incredible that I can't do without God's divine intervention. Let's go. Yeah. And we're trying to compete with horses. We're not comparing ourselves with man and getting worn out. We're not just doing the basic things. You've got to do more than that. And you've got to expect God to do more than that. And the point right here for us is in a big choice, uh, in a big church, if you struggle just being a disciple, you're not going to compete with the mission team. You're going to struggle on the mission team. If you struggle just to be at all the meetings of the body and to get to Wednesday nights, how will you last on the mission team? If you struggle, uh, you know, getting to devotionals on time and being on time, you will struggle on the mission team. If you struggle with sharing your faith now, it's not magically going to change when you get on the mission team. You will not get better at it. You've got to practice now so that you're great when you get there. You know, if you're not good at getting discipling and you're not good at receiving feedback, you're not magically going to get better when you get out on the mission team. And if you struggle to be a giver rather than a taker, it's not magically going to change when you get out there. But the good news for us is God expects us to compete with horses. We can compete with horses. We just got to not look at the injustices of the world. Jeremiah could have changed his heart so that he loves these people rather than wanting them to be destroyed. And we're going to have Gene talk about competing with horses. Faster than a horse. She's cool. Um, Yeah, so I came on this mission team knowing that I have to have a heart that's prepared to serve. I knew it would be a really small church and everyone would have to serve in various ways to fill the gap. Kind of like what Ben was saying about communions, welcomes, all of that. Um, Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it stopped me from feeling weary. Just like Jeremiah, there are moments where I felt weary and complained, like having to share for this point because Freeman can't be here. Nah, (laughs) Nah. but the reality of the day-to-day of being on a mission team can get tiring at times. We do have a lot of fun, but there's also so much to do. Um, I can get so weary at times having to share my faith and feeling like it's not very fruitful. Um, Public speaking, going out of my way to give people lifts a lot, babysitting for the whole day, not having my best friends around me and having to constantly put myself out there and build new friendships. Mm. Um, In those moments, I can complain to God and be like, I'm so tired of giving and I wish I didn't have to be giving. And just like Jeremiah, these complaints seem reasonable to me. And God's response to Jeremiah here is probably how he would have responded to me too. If all of that has made me wary, how can I run with horses? Um, I think a verse that really helped me with my heart that I had to commit to memory is Matthew 20, verse 28. And it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Seeing Jesus' example of serving and giving his life as a ransom for us really called me higher in my giving. He's who I want to imitate instead of comparing myself to how much others did. And I had to pray heaps that God would help me have the heart that Jesus has in being a servant to serve without complaining, without limits, and wholeheartedly. There have been so many moments where I've had to do things that I don't really want to, um, but an instance that comes to mind is taking a, a young disciple abung under my wing, giving her a list to everything that we have on in the week. And honestly, it does get tiring at times because she lives about 15 to 20 minutes away from me and I think I could have easily made the excuse like, I'm too tired, I need to figure out my time, my job, my visa situation. 
Um, but I chose not to make those excuses and chose to say yes, to do what horses can do instead of what men can do. And it's so amazing how God has really worked through that and the effect that it has on her life mm -hmm. and how she's someone that says yes to everything and serves others without prompting. Mm -hmm. And I found so much joy through serving wholeheartedly, though I may feel weary. And God constantly shows me that He's given me so much more capacity than I've realized. And I'll never get to fulfill that if I'm just content running with men. Awesome. <clears throat> And Jean really is competing with horses. And you know that theme comes in the New Testament about how you're going to run the race. Are you going to verse man or are you going to verse a horse? Fourth and final point, and I'll be quick, is uh, treasures in heaven. Let's go. So I'm trying to sober us up about the mission team so that we can think about that. But I also want you to, 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 to leave inspired as well that there is treasure to this. There's treasures in heaven. And if you go to Matthew 6, verse 19... This is a familiar passage. I remember the first time I read it, I didn't know heaven, you could get treasures in heaven. It blew my little mind. I was like, wow, I can accumulate treasures in heaven? But as I read it more and more, there's more application to it. In verse 19, Jesus will say, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermins do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So there's a point that you can accumulate these treasures in heaven. But actually, Jesus says right here, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And sometimes you get a bit mature in the kingdom and you think, well, I don't treasure anything. You know, I don't have heaps of possessions. I don't, you know, go after work. I don't go after money. I don't go after these things. I'm treasureless. But actually, Jesus assumes that all of us treasure something and our heart is somewhere. He actually says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. We actually store up and treasure a lot of things. And going on the team, you actually realize, what, what do I truly treasure? Where's my heart really at? And it was a sobering thing for us. For Brooke and me, we treasured a lot of things, a lot more than I actually thought. When you got to sell everything or you got to chuck it in a van to move up there, you realize how much stuff I really have. And there's a point where you got to say, where's my heart truly at? Am I treasuring the things of this earth? And I'm going to get Brooke to share. Um, yes, God has taught me a lot about sacrificing for the mission over the past few months. Um, I had considered the idea of sacrificing before moving there. Like, of course, I'd talked about it, I'd thought about it, I prayed about it. I thought I was all over it. Um, but the thing is, is I went into the planning, planting, ready to sacrifice in areas that I, like, already felt good about sacrificing in. And I think in those areas, I kind of already had my treasures in heaven. Um, and so what happened is that I, I got to the planting and I ended up a little confused because God was not calling me to be sacrificial in the ways that I expected, uh, but he was calling me to give up areas of my life that I was not expecting, and that was very hard for me. Um, you know, I'm naturally an adventurous person, um, you know, I've, and I've had many years to get used to being away from my family um, and my friends for long periods of time, so I was ready to be isolated. You know, I'm naturally outgoing and extroverted, so I was ready to invest in new friendships, to work well, to work with women I didn't know well, um, you know, to get stuck into sharing and hospitality because I naturally like those things. And so looking back, I have to laugh that I really thought that God's plan for my sacrifice wouldn't actually involve any sacrifice. Um, <laughs> what I was not ready for was the fact that, you know, we applied to over 20 rentals, and by the time, you know, the time to move got closer and closer, and in the end, we ended up having to just say yes to whatever we were offered. And the house we moved into was very different from the brand new home that I had just bought back in Sydney and was living in with Ben. You know, there are so many things to be grateful for about the house we moved into. But to be honest, I didn't like it. It's old, there's no dishwasher and the shower leaks and there's something living in the walls that gives me the creeps. And, and I didn't realize how much that would get to me. Um, you know, I signed up to have one campus brother come and live with us for one month. And then, you know, the idea was that the other brothers would move up and they'd find a brother's flat. And in the end, we had three brothers living with us for three months. And during that time, I found out I was pregnant. 
And at one point, we had so many people in our house that Ben's brother came to stay and he had to sleep in the backyard in a tent. <laughs> and we have one bathroom. And so God was really revealing to me where my treasures lay. He was showing me something that I honestly found a little hard to accept because I didn't understand until that point how much my heart longed for comfortability, for material wealth, for the bragging rights that having a beautiful home gives me. Um, that really humbled me. But, you know, the beautiful thing is, is that when I look back now at these things, um, you know, I actually treasure those times. I treasure the memories of having my house packed with people. And once it came time for the brothers to move out, I would have happily had them stay for more months. Don't tell them I said that, but, <laughs> but it is true, I would have. Um, I treasure the memories of all the people that have come to visit me um, and stay in my little house, what wonderful fellowship we had. And it, it, um, that matters so much more than the fact that there are weird tiles in the bathroom, you know. Um, and especially as women, I think we can really wait for all our ducks to be in a row before we trust God enough to do the faithful thing. We say things like, oh, when the time is right, when my job allows, when I've grown enough, uh, when the perfect job opportunity comes up, you know, when God makes it clear to me, that one always gets me. I'm like, what does that mean? Is God going to appear in the sky and tell you now's the perfect time? He's never going to do that. Now is the time. Being part of a mission team has put a spotlight on the limitations that I placed on how much I was willing to trust God, but it's been so good for me. I've grown so much and I am so grateful for every little thing I've had to give up to put my treasure in the right place. And I can assure you that when the time comes, you will too. Awesome. You know, it's a, it really does expose where your heart's at and the things that you treasure. And at the end of my life, I don't think I'm going to treasure the house that I had yeah. or the house that I lived in. I'm going to treasure the memories that I made with the team. I'm going to treasure the moments where I did the faithful thing, even though it was hard, even though I had to sacrifice. And the question comes for you is, what do you truly treasure? Mm. You know, the question to ask and expose those things is if we planted a church at the end of the year, who would actually be ready for that? Yeah. Who would be able to get their stuff out of the house and buy a new place or rent or do whatever? What do we truly treasure? You know, it's funny. One, one, one person said, the reason I won't go on the team with you guys is because my job is too good. And the sad thing was they lost their job within a month of saying, we're not coming. And I just think, man, God has a funny way of exposing the things that we treasure and taking away those things. And many people have sacrificed many ways to be on the team. Yeah. Guys, I had four points from the text uh, this afternoon, but I want to leave you with this, that we have some places to plant. Yeah. If you don't know, New Caledonia is beautiful, but it's got a population of 290,000 people. This is a city we can target very soon, and we have a remnant group right there. And these are the shores if you want the appeal of moving there one day. Sacrifice, wow. <laughs> That's a real sacrifice to be there. But you know what the true sacrifice is going to be? Is for someone to learn French and to be able to preach and study the Bible in French. And you know what we're doing? We've, we've told Ryan, you've got to learn French. We bought him a French Bible and we're trying to get this dude ready. But there is sacrifice and there's hard parts to it. We've got to get to Canberra as well. Yeah. Canberra almost has half a million people. And that's one of the places we've got to get to as a spa region. We've got to plant Townsville. 178,000 people. Let's go Townsville. We've got to plant Hobart. Population, 220,000 people. We've got to plant Samoa. Yeah. Is there any Samoans up in the house? 220,000 people. And we've got to plant Tonga as well. 106,000 people. But there's... The, the, the photo is less appealing <laughs> than the other ones. I just threw that out there for Dave, you know. I don't know if Dave's here. But guys, there's many places as the spa region that we got to get to. Yes. Yeah. But it's not really, we don't have a leadership issue.
we have a willingness issue that the team needs to be willing. People need to be able to throw their hand up and say, man, I'll go to wherever I need to go. Yeah, Here I am, send me. I want to have these beautiful feet that Paul talks about. Amen. That's the lesson.